Welcome back to the Tech Ed Podcast. We are live streaming on YouTube from Automate. This is the largest gathering of automation professionals anywhere in North America. And it you can tell, I mean, 25,000 people are visiting here in Detroit, Michigan. 750 exhibitors at this, at this incredible show, including the company that is led by our next guest, who I'm about to to announce. But before I do that, I also have to share that we are live from the FANUC Education Pavilion. FANUC, of course, being the largest robotics and CNC manufacturer, the leader in factory automation, not just here in the United States, but around the globe. And I will tell you that our next guest was described to me by the people at FANUC as, quote, and this is their words, not mine, a legend in the world of automation. So they literally called our guest a legend in the world of automation. I'm going to tend to agree. Absolutely phenomenal background. We're going to have a really, really fascinating conversation with Robbie Kamaljanovic. And Robbie is the chairman and CEO of ACETA, which is an organization really well known to people in manufacturing, in advanced manufacturing, uh, and is going to be really well known in just a moment to any of our listeners who aren't familiar with your organization, Robbie. But let me just start out by welcoming the legend in automation to the well, Tech Podcast you. Studio. <laughs> It's it's awesome to have you here, and that it's really great was to be here. it was the it was the folks at Fanuc. You and I were to, together at the ASI, the Integrator yeah. System Integrators Conference in uh, San Diego, Carlsbad, California, to be exact, uh, a couple short months ago, and that's when they said, "Oh, you got to have Robbie on." So <laughs> it's really it's awesome to have you here, and, and I want to I want to make sure that we really educate our listeners about the incredible work that you and your team are doing. The word integrator may not be completely familiar to everybody in manufacturing and everybody who's listening. So maybe you could just start out, Robbie, by telling us a little bit about what is an integrator and what is the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on this here. And uh, when I hear legend, I feel really old. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so an integrator, what we do, we basically take all kinds of technologies we can find in the marketplace and we integrate them into solutions. Okay. So our, our mission is to go into manufacturing facilities, identify the challenges, whether it's a labor challenge or a technology challenge, and then we find the right solution, the right technology, and right. integrate that into a solution. So that's really what an integrator is. Um, yeah. And Fanuc, of course, we've been with Fanuc for 40 years. We just yeah. celebrated our 40th uh, wow. anniversary, April 1st. Amazing. Um, and yeah, we've been exclusive with Fanuc for all these years. So That's it's, incredible. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And I know the whole team thinks really, really highly of you. We'll have Fanuc uh, president and CEO Mike Chico on with us later sure. today. Uh, and I know he uh, he has just t- tremendous things to say about your organization. So when you talk about integrating these components, um, I'm guessing it's robots, it's programmable logic controllers, it's conveyors, it's sensors, it's actuators, all these kind of things. I mean, is, is, is that right? Is it all this different advanced manufacturing technology that you're integrating towards solutions? Yes, it is. And, and so there's all kinds of different integrators out there. For us, we're what we would consider robot integrators. So okay. pretty much if there's no robot involved, then we lose some of the interest. Okay. Um, what a robot does for you, it gives you a tremendous flexibility and redeployment and changing uh, the application if needed. Right. And uh, so we've we've always stuck with having the robot as the centerpiece of, of our automation solution versus hard automation. Okay. Which is another which is another way of automating some processes that are typically like higher volume, longer life cycle. Uh, with a robot you're much more flexible. So and our in house expertise really lies in, in that heart and soul of a robot programming uh, deploying that with all kinds of technologies, whether it's on the welding side, so you're, sure. add, you're adding, you know, a torch to mm-hmm. a robot, whether that is just material handling or you're using the robot to actually sh- change the shape of a part. Sure. Through polishing, through yep. drilling, milling, all kinds of things you can do in a CNC. We do those kind of stuff on, on a robot applications applications as well. And I'm sure you've seen just tremendous evolution in terms of robotics technology over the course of the 40 years that that uh, Aceda specifically has been working with Fanuc. And, and it really is, you meet some of these companies that have had these incredible partnerships and and they, they really, they, re, they transcend business relationships, mm-hmm. right? It's all about mission. It's all about helping each other grow the next generation of the workforce, all these exciting things. So specifically to Aceda geographically, you know, where are you headquartered? Where do you do business? And, yeah. and are there specific sizes or types of companies that you tend to gravitate toward? Yeah. So we have two locations in the Midwest. So we're pure Midwest company. Okay. Um, we have, of course, sales and service across the country. Sure. Uh, anywhere, West Coast, East Coast, North, South, and so forth. Um, in terms of our, so the two, let me back up. Those two locations are both locations that have engineering, assembly, 
We have uh, our own in-house fabrication shop as well okay. in our Iowa location. Where in Iowa? Uh, in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Okay, so sure. Western well, Iowa. Yeah, way over by yep. Omaha. Yep. yep. Okay, right by it. Omaha. Yeah. So I fly in and out of Omaha all okay. the time. It's sure. like eight miles from the airport there. Perfect. So beautiful location. It is. Um, and of course, Wisconsin. You, right. <laughs> yep. You know that quite well. I certainly do. Uh, it's a, it's a definitely the, the manufacturing density around the Rust Belt, mm-hmm. uh, the Midwest in that area is uh, very strong. Absolutely. Um, very competitive. And uh, everybody is uh, is competing for labor, right? And so that certainly has uh, has a big tailwind effect for us in in our industry, and we're pretty excited about that. Absolutely. Uh, if you think about the um, the opportunities, and I, I speak on these topics a lot, I know you do as yep. well. And you know, up until about three or four years ago, it was guaranteed that I would get the question: Are the robots going to take all the jobs? I mean, it was just guaranteed. It wasn't it wasn't a question of whether that question would come up. It was just how deep into the Q and A period yeah, yeah. it was going to come up. And we don't get that question anymore. I think people are starting to realize that in order to have a, a vibrant manufacturing sector, we need to leverage the incredible talent we already have in as many ways as possible. And if we can take some of the more mundane, perhaps traditionally um, less safe. Um, maybe not as well paying jobs and, and replace those with automation and then upskill the people that were doing those jobs into new skills and new opportunities cont- and, and working with the automation solutions that, that ACETA is implementing. It, it's really a win-win. The company ends up being able to reduce costs. The consumer ends up being able to pay a lower price for the product that they're buying. And the employee is making more money and having a much more fulfilling yep. job. Are you seeing the same thing? Oh, 100%, 100%. We always talk about the three Ds, right? Yep. The dirty, dull, and dangerous right. jobs. Those are the kind of jobs that you start with automating. Exactly. Um, but I, we, have a, we have a much bigger problem in the United States specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we look at the next five years, we're going to have about 3 million job openings in manufacturing. It's crazy. Just in, in North America. Right. 10, 10 million across the world. Wow. Right? But 3 million in, in manufacturing mm-hmm. here in the U.S. And when you look at one robot does about... Uh, capacity labor capacity of about three people if you're running three shifts okay right? so wow. so we need to we need to backfill one million robots just to keep up right just to keep up with the baby boomers retiring uh with next generation not being as excited about being in manufacturing right and we're not even talking about reshoring right so exactly. that, that's a whole another dynamic it that is. has been brought to us over the last couple of years with a lot of that you know uh, geopolitical challenges exactly um people are moving a lot of their manufacturing back to the united states indeed and they can't do that without automating because there's not enough labor and there's there's just there's a price competitiveness that comes with it too exactly but to to your point in in terms of how do we how do we go to market how do we sell not sell but how do we explain automation in a way where people will, will receive it right when i got into this field I had to answer to my family and yep. my friends all the time. It's like, oh, so you're going to replace all these workers right. now. And I'm like, when we get to that point, mm-hmm. let's start talking about that point. Right. We're not there. Yeah, exactly. So every one of our customers, I can tell you right now, they hire more people as they get more successful, better performance, yep. better competitiveness. Mm-hmm. They add more people when they can. Right. They can't find the people. Exactly. And to your point, the folks they have on their manufacturing floors, they're figuring out how can we how can we scale their talent right so instead of having five five guys with a torch welding on parts Mm -hmm. have one each one of those five guys operate five welding robots right so now you're scaling exactly now now you really have the opportunity to scale and we're Mm -hmm. always talking about you know like arc time in the welding world it's like the arc time is typically if you're at close to 20 percent, you're doing pretty well yep that's that's not a whole lot of (laughs) effective use of talent right sure so that's that's kind of where when we explain what we do to right. people that are outside of our industry, yep. um, we really look at, hey guys, you, we all still want our cars and our watches right. and our iPhones. Who's going to make it? Exactly, exactly. And I think we got a big reminder of that going through the pandemic, where mm-hmm. you know I've mentioned it a number of times that when when we could all get what we wanted when we wanted it at a price we wanted to pay for it, it's really easy to take manufacturing for granted, right? You just you know you go on Amazon and you you know, hit a couple of buttons and it shows up at your shows door at and your it's door, like, yeah. it's just magic. And it's like, no, wait a minute. There's, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of manufacturers all over the United States and around the globe that are responsible for putting those 
assemblies together for creating those products, for creating sub-assemblies, for being suppliers to large OEMs that a lot of us never think about. Recent guest on our podcast is a gentleman by the name of Azatash Patti, who is the managing director for McKinsey and Company, mm-hmm. the big consulting company. Yep. And he, he runs their whole operation across North America, just wrote a book called The Titanium Economy. And it's all of these small to mid-sized companies that nobody's thought about that are producing products for larger companies and so you don't know the owner you, you know it's not like a jeff bezos it's not a Elon musk but they're they're quietly creating tremendous amounts of wealth for themselves and others they're they're really the lifeblood of american manufacturing and the american economy don't oftentimes get enough credit is that the size of company you're typically working with or is it larger fortune 500 companies is it everything in between tell us about that yeah so we we cover pretty much the, the total spectrum okay so fortune 500 companies you know whether it's in agriculture or you know, the John Deere's of the world and sure. the Caterpillars and, and those guys, Bobcats, a lot in construction, equipment manufacturing. Yep. Um, but we also do a lot of work with smaller mom and pop job shops. Okay. So job shops uh, are about 70% of job shops in the United States do not have automation currently in place. That's crazy. That is a tremendous market for us yes. that we need to go after. Absolutely. So we, we've done a lot of interesting things over the last few years. We're trying to understand how can we get these folks into automation because we want to we want to preserve those jobs for sure right and um so we developed a, a whole slew of standard products which okay. are which are predefined pre-engineered built to specific standards um and are low cost of entry okay so it the, the, we're trying to take the fear factor out of automation for the smaller shops absolutely right? when we work with the guys like conagra and food manufacturing and and so forth those guys, they they get automation. They sure. understand it. It was just always a matter of what's a return of investment. Yep. The smaller shops where you have the owner operator mm-hmm. that runs the business, right. um, it's a little more scary because it's not their core competency. Right. Their core competency is whatever whatever yeah. their making process parts, is. Meeting lead making, times, yeah, making parts, meeting lead times, those right. kind of things. Um, and then to bring in automation, they've, if they've been in manufacturing for sometimes generations. So bringing in, bringing in automation and robotics to them is a scary thing. Sure, and absolutely. It's an, and it's an investment right. that doesn't necessarily add value to the part. Right. It just adds, it just adds capacity. Yep. And so that's, uh, yeah. So it's we, a big we, step. Yeah. we have customers that literally are like two people in the business, and yep. we have customers that are 100,000 people around the world. So some of those turnkey solutions that you mentioned, and we've mm-hmm. talked a little bit about welding, we've talked about material handling, but, but give us a sense of those the, those turnkey solutions that you, mm-hmm. you referenced. Yeah, so so there's two ways that we go after, after automating our customers. One of them is you walk into their shop floor, you, you listen, it's, it's like a consulting engagement, right? really. And it's figuring out how do you help that customer to, to solve their challenge, mm-hmm. whatever the challenge might be. Labor force is certainly one we talked sure. about. But it could also be technical challenges, mm-hmm. and and it could be one of those dirty, dull, and dangerous yeah. jobs, sure. right? So when when we do that, that becomes a custom turnkey solution. Mm-hmm. So we literally address exactly the challenge that they have in front of them. Got it. And those projects, they can some some of them last a year long because they're massive, l- sure. large systems. And then the other piece is when we come in with standard products, right. which we have in all our verticals that we operate in. Uh, whether it's palletizing, for example, like yep. end of line case packing and palletizing, mm-hmm. those kind of applications, sure. we have standard products for that. So it's awesome. like, okay, here's the size, here's the range, here's what we can do with that. Right. And that's that's a different sale for sure because that's like it's all about capability, availability, and price. Yep. The standard solu- the custom solutions, it's all about how do you solve that problem. Right. And yep. and they're, they're both and, fun. Yeah. Innovation. Yep. Uh, Technology comes in all the time, vision systems, right. um, any kind of, if you think about it, pretty much anything a human being does today, mm-hmm. whether that is take apart and move it, uses the eyes, yep. uses the hand yeah. of, in terms of sensing of right. weight and pressure and so forth, all of that can be done with technology today. Absolutely. But you have to look at what makes sense. Mm-hmm. And this is where some companies fail at some point often in their first endeavors. Right is trying to over automate. Yeah. And I'm not going to name any names, but you know, a, a, a massive electric company with a name that starts with a T, for example, <laughs> right. um, they went out and very early on, they tried to automate the heck out of their assembly process. And, and it, for the biggest part failed huh. because there, it doesn't make sense of always over automate everything. So our right. job as the consultant yep. is to make sure that the return of investment, that it makes sense from a technology and process perspective, right. 
Um, and that's that's what we do. So our sales uh, personnel, they're, they're all engineers. They're all technical right. guys. Have to be, yeah. They have to be. Um, and it's, it's a ton of fun. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I, some of my friends are like commodity traders. That's right. a very different world. For right? sure. Yep. They're both sales guys, but yeah. it's a very different world. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, at the, in the end, you're trying to add value for a client mm -hmm. in one way or the other, but, but the creativity that's required on the integration side and really as somebody who ran manufacturing companies for yep. the better part of a quarter century, um, really thinking about, I, I like to think about automation as a lean tool, right? So yep. it's we're, we're trying to drive waste out of a process somewhere. Yep. And whether that's you know whether that's improving yield, whether it's improving throughput, well, you know wh whether it's making a job safer so that we're quality. mitigating risk, yeah, quality yep. for sure. Mm -hmm. All of those things are things that we would you'd do a Kaizen event, you do a continuous yep. improvement event, you'd identify a problem, you drive it back to root cause, you'd solve the root cause, and that's the way I like to think about automation, especially for those small to mid-sized businesses, because you're exactly right. You know the risk of failure if I'm General Motors, if I'm you know some you know, Amazon whatever, and I fail in an automotive automation project. I'm not happy about that, but I'll survive it. You know, a small to mid-sized company with maybe five, ten people working in it. You know, you could invest your entire annual cash flow in one project, and yep. if that doesn't end up having a payback that that's appealing to you, that can be a really, really big risk. So, getting it right, consulting with those clients, and and really thinking through what the solutions need to look like, that's a huge part of your business, I know. And then, you know, as you think about this, the standardized products as well. I, I really love that as a business model and, and because it's really the best of both worlds. I mean, you you have the same challenge everybody else does in trying to scale, right? I mean, you need tremendous amounts of talent, whether it's yep. somebody working in your operation who's actually performing the physical integration of the solutions or it's somebody out in the field who's working with a customer to design a new solution. Those people aren't easy to find, especially good ones. And so they have, having that standardized um, product model allows you to to be both really creative with your customers, but also to to scale in a way that maybe doesn't require the same amount of human capital to to, to be able to drive revenue growth. So I think that's a really, really fascinating combination of, of products that you have there. The other thing I find fascinating is that you've been a partner of Fanuc for you know almost a half century, for you know 40 years. That's a long, long time. Uh, what is it about Fanuc that appeals to you, Robbie, and, and your team? Yeah, so as, you know, certainly I haven't been there for 40 years. Right. <laughs> But um, when our founder, John Berg, 40 years ago, made the decision to become an integrator and started one of the very first integrators for FANUC sure. um, outside of the automotive uh, sector, um, he, he really had a great vision very early on. If, if, we, if we try to be good at multiple different robot brands, mm -hmm. we're never going to be world class. Got so it. we made the decision a long time ago that we're going to focus on one brand, one flavor of robots. Mm -hmm. And in uh, certainly I'm a little biased there. In my opinion, we picked the best one. Yeah, no, I agree with and, you. And so when Not you look at the range that Fanuc offers from very small, small little Scara robots to very large M2000 robots that mm -hmm. are, you know, so big that they move cars around. Right, you know, exactly. Certainly We've they seen, the Corvette. It, yeah, seen the Corvette. Seen the Corvette moving yep. around. We have two of those in our floor right now. Actually, not the Corvette, but the the big robots. Do you really? Wow. Yeah. So it, it's really a, a, a tremendous range and that they offer. And sure. whether that's in the food grade robots, mm -hmm. of course they do paint robots, yep. material handling, welding. It's like mm -hmm. pretty much you can cover all of the manufacturing right. Delta, sector. Six axis, Delta six axes, Delta robots, yeah. exactly. So high speed pick and place mm -hmm. robots. Um, and and so for us, our ecosystem, we can only be really good. If we focus, sure, and and so we made a long time ago the decision to focus on on Fanuc products, Fanuc services. We have sixteen master certified um, service techs wow. that are that are in our force. So that that's a that's a commitment, and, for sure. And uh, so and and we feel that Fanuc is also it literally, it, although they're publicly traded in in, in Japan, they are a family totally. run business. Yep. And so as you know, I was just over there last week mm -hmm. and. Meeting with the owners and with the founders and the founder's son and, and and his son, it is um it's just it's a it's a very collaborative relationship. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The um the times that I've been over and it's been a couple of years, but been to the private show twice yep. in the last in the last decade and um and you're right. I mean, you can meet with Dr. Anaba, you can yep. meet with Kenji Yamaguchi, the president. I mean, they're they're accessible, they're friendly, they they want they want to learn about your business, supportive. Um, and, and then bringing that leadership style and that culture here to the United States under the direction of people like Mike and others. It's just, uh, it's a great, great company to be partner with. I, I often say in another part of my life where we actually do a lot of work with it, with Fanuc, I don't know what I did in my prior life to be fortunate enough to be chosen to be one of their partners <laughs> here, but, but, uh, but it must have been something pretty special because it's just an amazing organization.
It, it it really is. And uh, one one of the other things they do, which I, I haven't really seen from anyone else, is they have this uh, called President's Council. Yep. And we meet twice a year and we sit down and they, they listen to their customers right. around what do you think, where can we improve, what are the things we did right over the last six months, what are the things we need to improve on. Sure. And they literally listen. We go back six months later, we sit down, we're like, okay, here's the list of things that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And then they present us, here are the changes that we've made to address that. Sure. And that's something, um, I don't know any other product company that does that. For sure. Yeah, and it's, and it's key to their success. And a thing, yep. another key to their success and something they've done really, really well is their commitment to education. Oh, yeah. And, um, and under the direction of Paul Aiello, their executive director of their education team, um, and, and other individuals on that group, I mean, just totally committed more schools teaching on the FANUC platform here in the United States than any other platform by far. Um, and it really speaks to um, just it kind of comes back to this question of talent. How do we inspire more people mm -hmm. toward these amazing careers? How do we get young people excited about them? How do we take people who are maybe in other elements of the workforce in hospitality and retail and in some other element of the workforce now in tech, which is contracting a little bit, get them excited about careers in advanced manufacturing specific to the world of integrated in integration um, are there specific attributes or skills or competencies that you look for because that role might be different than somebody who's doing factory automation in an OEM, for example? Is, or is there more commonality or are there things that are specific to your model? Yeah, so as, as an integrator, as we just talked about, right. we look at all kinds of different applications. So, sure. so you really have to be uh, quick thinking on your feet um, and flexibility in how you approach challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, is key, right? Uh, if you're if you're an, an automation engineer at General Motors or or wherever, you, you are you're dedicated to either you're at the assembly line or or you're you know at the paint line or so forth. It's it's a, a little bit less of a range, sure, in challenges that you see every day, right? Uh, so it's very ultra focused. For us, it's like we have some we have uh, specific people that we would say are are like uh, technology. Uh, thinkers, lead, leaders sure. in specific applications. So okay. if you're, we have a, a group uh, of people that are really good at welding, right? Okay. So, yeah. so when we have welding challenges, mm -hmm. those are the guys that, that we tap into. Sure. Then we have other guys that are, that are really good at um, high speed placements, okay. for example. That's a, that's a different skill set. Yep. But as a, as a team, we need to, we need to be able to address almost everything that's out there. Otherwise sure. we're not doing any good services to our customers. So it's it's really it's like that. Think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Be creative. Um, don't get sucked into a narrative. Just just right. make sure that um, you're you're looking at every challenge with a with open eyes. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and I would I, I'd like to think that the just the wide variety of different projects mm -hmm. that these folks are working on makes it really appealing to somebody who yeah. likes that variety in yeah. the workplace. You're going to work on one really cool project, perhaps in one market space for three, six, 12 months, and then you're going to be assigned to, to some other application. And so obviously the commonality of the platform, the commonality of its manufacturing technology and having your own specialty, but putting that specialty to work in a lot of different spaces. Is that one of the things you hear from your team members about what they like about working in integration? hundred percent. Yeah. It, it, it's that, it's that range of, of options and challenges that, that are allowed in, in their jobs. Sure. Um, and, and our, our folks will talk to that. We have schools coming through every week, at least once. Do you really? Where we have high schools, um, we elementary, not yeah. elementary, but middle schools. Yep. We have middle schools coming through cool. at least once a week. And you know, education is dear to my heart. Oh, I'm on no, the board is. of the educational foundation. I and, know. And, uh, so that the appeal to the job is that there's almost never that you do the same thing the week after week sure. after week. It doesn't happen. Right. Today, as you said, today you're working on some big well system and tomorrow you're going to put dog bones into a box. Right. right? Yeah. So it, it, it's it's Total literally variety. that range. Yeah, and, exactly. And you get to play with robots every day. It's right. Like, it's, yeah. like, it's, it's like every kid's dream. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. From welding to dog bones and playing with robots. I mean, what, what could be better? That's <laughs> what could be better. That, exactly. That's awesome. Where do you find these people? Uh, so I would say about 50 percent of our programmers when, when they come into into Aceta, we bring directly from a tech school. So okay. we work with a, several tech schools around the sure. country um, and we recruit them straight out of school. The other 50 percent, they come from the marketplace. So they come with some experience. They have to have a healthy balance between, you know, fresh thinkers right. and, and experience. Of course. And when you put those two together into a team, then you can achieve a lot of things. But we really have to in, in our this is a job that didn't exist a few years ago, right? right? So yeah. this is not something that uh, the uh, the educational system was ready for 20 right. years ago. 
now they're getting there. Now, sure. uh, you mentioned Paul, he's done a tremendous job Amazing in the education of 1,500 schools. Isn't that crazy? Think about the exposure, exposure of that. There's, totally. there's what, it's 100,000 students that come out of those programs right. and, and they, they're ready to jump into the, uh, into the integrator manufacturing world. Exactly. And so we, we really start very early on. And, and there's all kinds of studies out there why do we have you know less female than male in our industry right. and so forth? And we're trying to address those as Indeed. well. Um, and I, I have to say that over the last five years that that I've been involved, it, I think we're at about eighteen percent female okay. uh, wow. by now. That's great. How many employees do you have? Uh, we're one hundred and thirteen. Okay, great. One hundred and thirteen people. So that's across the spectrum. But there's sure. about there's about ten, twelve that are mm -hmm. on the technology side awesome. of the yeah. business. Yeah. Everyone, you know, typically HR and those kind of roles, they're very often and they're they're out, they're female led, um, and that's similar in our business. But to grow our technical base uh, with female is, right. is, is is awesome. That's fantastic. It's awesome. Yeah. and they bring such a different mindset totally. to the game too. Yep. It's very healthy to have that. It we're, is. We're when, really excited. When when I was in my manufacturing days, we had uh, we hired a ton of of um, welding talent, and mm -hmm. and yep. so. And and I can tell you when we would we would hire women welders when you could find them, way I mean as a general rule and it's a generalization. Hope I don't offend anybody, but but way better attention to detail, way more patient. Um, you know, just just based upon apparently the way they're wired or what what have you. But but really really fascinating to see. Um, you know, more and more women in manufacturing. I know there was a couple panels here this week about women in manufacturing, yep. which is fantastic here at Automate. Um, huge focus for. For us, my wife's a, an engineer, um, and oh, cool. I went through the whole, you know, undergrad and, and master's degree engineering program. Um, huge advocate for women in, in STEM and women in engineering, and, and I think it makes us better companies the more, you know, more diverse we can be. So it's a, it's a great effort to, to be a part of. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you mentioned technical colleges, that, mm -hmm. and that's where you're doing some of your recruiting. What are their degrees in? Automation, electromechanical, what, what types of degrees do these people come to you with? There actually are robot degrees now, like okay. robot programming okay. uh, uh, degrees. They're they're typically two year tech schools. Got it. Um, I'm I'm a big proponent of going that route. Right. Um, I can't tell you how many how many folks I know that go to get a four year degree and then two years later they they work in a very different field. Right. Um, so yeah, so typically uh, electrical mechanical engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we need those sure. to design the systems. Yep. Um, software engineers um then as i mentioned programming yep. uh, robot programming uh technicians uh those are really the typical roles okay. that, that we're looking for so if a young person is interested in in that type of a career uh you know a couple lessons that i think i just heard here you don't necessarily have to pile on a ton of debt yep. uh, through a four-year degree program yep. maybe earning a degree that isn't as interesting or won't necessarily have a have a career for you when you're done in some cases you can go to a local technical college a community college get a two-year associate's degree in robotics and automation and electromechanical technology and have an amazing career uh, at, a, at an organization like ACETA. So it's, I mean, it's a great, great message for our young people that you've got all of these options and we really need to do the hard work of exposing more and more of them to these amazing opportunities. You talk about um, tours through your manufacturing facilities, you talk in your, in your integration facilities, you talk about uh, certainly the work that FANUC is doing. What are other things that we should be doing to interest more people in these careers? Yeah, I, I think there's 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 like a generational shift, mm -hmm. right? So um, there, I, I think there just needs to be more exposure. Yep. And that's why we do tours all sure. the time. We bring schools through, we bring colleges through. Because uh, manufacturing, and you know this, has, has still somewhat of that stigma of being like dirty and loud right. and you know, it, it, it doesn't look like that anymore these days, right. especially when you automate with robotics. Yeah, for sure. So, so it, it also, our customers, they tell us that when they automate with robots, mm -hmm. their retention rate and, and their appeal to folks bringing them into manufacturing yeah. goes up like 10, That's awesome. 10x. I never right? thought so of that. That's awesome. If, if, you're, if, you're an, if, if you're competing for labor right. and you show the the applicants that you are a progressive thinker that yep. you're a progressive company that you care for the safety and the health of your employees and that you're you're invest into the future and mm -hmm. into technology right that's very appealing for sure versus the other company next door right that hasn't done anything other than buying new machines but 
but not automating at that's, all. That's right? a really, really deep comment when you think about it, that not only is automation not necessarily costing people their jobs, but the individuals who are working in companies that automate are more likely to stay for those, stay with those companies. So if you're mm -hmm. a company that believes, as I certainly do, that retention of your key talent is one of the most important things you can possibly do in terms of growing and expanding and having a vibrant business, automating those processes is one of the things that you can do to to retain that talent. That's that's a really, really fascinating observation. Frankly, one that I hadn't thought about as much time as I spent thinking about this stuff. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you credit the next three times I use that and then I'm just gonna steal it shamelessly. <laughs> that's but okay. That's, that's a phenomenal. <laughs> the more people talk about it, the better it is for all of us. Yeah, yes, that's absolutely. a really, really cool observation, Robbie. Uh, let's talk about trends. We're here at Automate. Mm -hmm. um, and even, I was here a year ago, and even, I mean, the um, prevalence of of AI, of, of machine learning, of advanced software, of vision systems, 3D scanning. I mean, it, it's just even in the last five years, it's amazing where this industry has come. What are some of those trends that you and Asita have your eyes on right now? Yeah, what, what comes up very often, and, and this is part of scaling automation into our manufacturing uh, customers, is ease of use. Okay. So that that's something where, again, we talked about earlier, the fear of automating right. and, and bringing in ease of use tools. Sure. Whether that's, you know, HMI interfaces, mm -hmm. anything that makes it easy uh, to deploy a robot into an application. Robots, collaborative robots. Collaborative robots. Certainly collaborative robots. They they have uh, they have made tremendous uh, strides over the last few years. I, I remember, um, I think UR was one yep. that, that was the, the big scale right um company that decided to do only collaborative right. robots right at, at 10 years ago i think yeah they, probably they, eight, they 10 years ago something yeah and uh so you certainly see that getting into other applications that we wouldn't have thought about in the past right. and those are those are also rising in size so yep. back in the days you know if a collaborative robot that can, has a has a payload of maybe 10 kilos 22 pounds right, right? today we're going up to almost 50 kilos. I know, exactly. I mean, those on are the CRXs, some, yeah. On, on, the, on the CR35, I think now it's coming to that payload range. Yep. Uh, the CRX, as you mentioned, the 25, 25 that's 25 yep. kilos. Right. Uh, and that goes up to 30 kilos mm -hmm. now with, with, you know, some technology tweaks on that. Um, those are some of the things that we haven't seen in the past. And right. we can deploy them now to way more applications than we've been able to do in the past with more reach. Yep. So you can, you know, a lot of the pelletizing, sure. um, for example. That's going to those kind of um, technologies because it's it's those are again jobs that you, a person shouldn't be doing. Right, it's not good for your back. It's not good for your body in in general. And um, use that person and put them somewhere else where they can create way more value. Right, than exactly. loading boxes in, yep. onto a pallet. Um, so ease of use is a big one, um, and the the world of vision mm -hmm. continues to evolve very quickly. And right. this is where AI comes in. Right, everybody's like. When when are you guys gonna use AI? I'm like we're already when, using right, it. Yeah, we, we've exactly. been using that for many years. <laughs> right. it, it's just now now it's a you know it's household a, name. Now it's a household word, name yeah. now, right? But we've been using it for a long time, like bin picking mm -hmm. applications. Right. Where we just put a box with a bunch of random parts in it mm -hmm. in front of a camera and yeah, and, it finds and, it. Yeah. and it figures out how to best not just find it, but how to best actually grip it sure. and move it. And so those are the machine learning processes that are Absolutely. running in the background, and that continues to to grow. Um, we have also, if you, if you look at it, um, from an ease of use perspective, um, using, scan <coughs> excuse me, using scanners, for example, sure. to generate code on the program, on the robot. Right. So you don't have to program the robot anymore. You, yep. you, you just upload basically a CAD model into the software uh -huh. and you point the robot in the right direction with yep. the, the scanner in the right direction and it writes a code for you. Yeah. That's amazing. So we're just trying to deploy more and more ease of use features right. on, on robots. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's almost hard to keep up with all of it. That's one it of the is. things I love about automate and just wandering around and you know, every time there's a company that popped up that has a space that you didn't, you didn't even know was a space and it's like, <laughs> wow, that's really, Really, really amazing. So, and we could talk for probably hours on the trends oh, in automation sure. and technology because I know it fascinates you and it certainly fascinates me. Um, but we do have a limited amount of time, and so we're getting close to the, to the end of our time here. Robbie, and I do have a, a final question for mm -hmm. you, and it's one we love to ask our guests here on the Tech Ed Podcast. And we're going to take you back in time before ACETA, before studying engineering, uh, growing up in when you were 15 years old, you were in Germany. Am I right about I that? I was in yeah. Germany, yes. So you're, you're a 15-year-old you're a young German man with this whole – life ahead of him. Um, if you could go back in time with everything you've learned, everything you've done, and give that young man one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, uh, invest in Bitcoin? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then get out early, right? Yeah, get, get out, out at the right get time. Get out on time, yeah. exactly. Get out on time. No, I, I, 
I feel like I live a pretty privileged life. Sure. Uh, and and uh, people ask me this all the time. I got into manufacturing when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that here. Sure, but, yeah. Uh, well, my, it was in Germany, whatever. It right? was in Germany, exactly. <laughs> my, my dad's, uh, uh, one of his good friends had a machine shop, a small okay. machine shop. Awesome. Four, four employees. Yeah. I was a half, you know, half-day employee after school. And uh, started making chips at 12 years old, okay. cleaning the machines yeah. and so forth. And then by 15, I was programming CNC machines. Okay. And so at that point, I already knew my path is That's going, where, I'm going. where it's going to go. That's I didn't know awesome. it was going to be robotics right. at that point. Yeah. I was a CNC machine tool guy, right? Yeah. So so I, I, I built a career on that. Um, boy, what would I have done? I don't know if I would have done anything different. I, I think I would have... I would have still studied engineering. I would sure. have still uh, gone down that path. Um, I was very lucky at the time because I knew I wanted to make a career in manufacturing. Yep. And uh, to have a technical background versus mm-hmm. a commercial or marketing, nothing wrong with that. But right. It's it's a, it's an engineering solution for sure. Uh, a, a career. So I, I'd say I would do that again. What what I would give advice to others um, at at fifteen year old is like find what your passion is about. Mm-hmm. You're going to be good at it. Right. Just yep. find what you're really passionate about. And that could be anything. But if it is manufacturing, mm-hmm. then go down a path and, and build a career out of For it. Sure. You will never be out of a job. Absolutely. No, I can't. I mean, I can't tell you. I can't tell you that I knew when I was 12 years old that I wanted to be in manufacturing. I did know I wanted to be a CEO of a company. I yes, mean, I had yes. that dream when I was a young, you know, relatively young man, pre-high school, and then and, and, and managed to to manifest that into reality over the course of time with the help of a lot of mentors and probably some some good fortune as well. But um but having found my way into manufacturing and, you know, in, in the, on the tech side early on and then, you know, really more in some of the more traditional manufacturing operations that I saw come of age through automation, robotics mm-hmm. and and um, and other technologies, I can't imagine wanting to be in any other market space. It's just been so fulfilling. It's so amazing. I have I have two kids um, and we insisted that both of them work in manufacturing while they were working <laughs> their way through post-secondary. I said, you don't have to pick that as a career. But you're gonna know what it's like to work in a manufacturing plant. You're you're gonna know what it's like to have that feeling of looking over your shoulder at the end of a day, seeing a sea of parts that you had a part in making, and you knew you know that those wouldn't have existed without your work. And the other thing I told them is I want you to know the amazing types of people that work in manufacturing. Oh, yeah. And there's you know there's probably a little bit of a stigma around manufacturing people that may go back 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and that if 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 it isn't if it hasn't changed, it is changing. Um, but just incredible. Um, diverse populations, wonderful people, hardworking people, good people that work in and around manufacturing. I've spent my whole career around them. You've spent your whole career here, around yeah. them. And I'm glad you spent your whole half hour or so here with us on the Tech Ed Podcast. Robbie Kamalyanovich, who is the chairman and CEO of Aceta. Such a fascinating company, fascinating background. You're a really interesting person, and I'm really glad we had this time together. Awesome. Thank you so much. Anytime. Anytime.